And he said, are you the one that's going to change the direction of your family tree? Or are you going to leave it for someone better than you down the line? Oh, my word. When he said that to me, my heart exploded in pain. And the thought of leaving this battle to someone better than me down the road killed me. And the second thing was, God was going to lay that question before Jason one day and say, hey, your dad didn't have what it takes. And women must rise to be Christian rather than simply seem Christian. My guest today is Fred Stoker, author of a couple different books we're going to get into today. What does this quote mean to you? Uh, it became my life quote. I mean, the, I don't even know where I saw it, uh, but it struck me deep to the core. You know, I didn't become a Christian until I was 23. And uh, so I had gone through high school, college, made a mess of things. And then uh, the Lord stepped into my life and, you know, of course, changed everything. But when we say change everything, what that does is it puts us in a position where not only are we saved permanently, but we need to begin to look in our real life as if we're saved. Right. And uh, we need our day to day life to look Christ like. And when I saw that where it's, you know, uh, we need to be Christian rather than just seem Christian, it struck me because so many people in the Western Christian church, for instance, uh, they're more interested in image over substance. And uh, that was never who I wanted to be. I, you know, if God says you can be free of something, I wanted to be free. If God says I can love my enemy, I want to learn how to do that. Otherwise, it's just a big sham. It's just a big country club we go to on Sundays. One of the uh, one of my Christian thought leaders that I really love that's been really uh, illuminating to me, um, and I believe he pulled this quote from C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, was the difference between becoming a nice person, which people understand religion and Christianity to be, versus becoming a moral and good person, and how becoming a nice person becomes harder but it's still grounded in um, what we as Christians talk about is like the world. You're still grounded in the world's rules. Uh, That's really and good. then one of the core elements here was that playing by the world's rules and being nice, that diminishes because part of what the Christian world and God is calling you to do is to recognize the spiritual battle that's actually happening. And this, yes. I think, really aligns with your brand and with what you're talking about. And so um, I want to come back to the 23 to 40, because I know that when we were talking off air, there's some details about that time period and specifically what happened as you're in your 40s that led to your first book. But can you, before we get there, share your personal journey with overcoming an addiction to pornography and how it's kind of influenced your life and work? Yeah, I'll just give you the quick story. Um, back in high school, the only thing I really wanted was to be all state quarterback. I mean, I didn't care about anything else. I didn't care about I cared a little about girls because I'm a guy and everything, but uh, I didn't care that much about it. I didn't drink alcohol. I didn't do a lot of things uh, that would impede my athletic abilities. OK, so. When I got to college, however, um, sports were taken away from me and I didn't I didn't really have that thing, that moral center anymore. And I was very homesick. I was 2000 miles from home. And so uh, it wasn't long before I had all of the uh, all my favorite porn magazines picked out and I was getting them each once a month at the campus drugstore, you know, we didn't have internet and all that junk back then, but um, I, I, I started to get really hooked on it. Uh, it seemed to make me feel better. It seemed to just make me feel more in control of my life somehow. Uh, turned out later that I learned that actually it controlled me. But then I started chasing girls heavily. And by the time I was one year out of college, I had four girlfriends. I was sleeping with three of them and I was engaged to be married to two of them. So, I mean, I was really way off, uh, way off the tracks when it came to the way I dealt with women. I mean, 
nobody seemed to be bothered. Uh, of course, if they would have found out about each other, they would have been. But it was a uh, it was a really crazy time, and a lot of people would look at that and say, "Gosh, Fred was a real pig," and I guess I was. But the wonderful thing about it is that it led to me meeting the Lord. I was in my office one night. Uh, everyone else had left the office building, and uh, I was just looking out the window at a California sunset, and uh, suddenly the scene changed. I don't know how, it wasn't a vision or anything like that, but just somewhere in my, my spirit, the scene changed and God began to show me what I had become, especially in terms of women. And it just broke my heart. I began to cry and I just said a simple prayer, Lord, I'm ready to work with you if you're ready to work with me. And, uh, I, I didn't even know if that prayer would stick, but it did. Uh, within, I'd say, a month, I was back in Iowa, had a new job, left all the girlfriends behind, and I had a chance to have a new life. And um, about a year later in church, you know, I was going to church for a year, and I had prayed that the Lord would show me um, what a Christian woman really looks like. I, I wasn't really looking for a mate or anything. I just, I'd been learning a lot about Christian living, and I just wanted to see a woman that kind of exhibited that. Um, God did more than that. He gave me my wife the first time I laid eyes on her. Uh, I heard him whisper, this is a girl you're going to marry. And we've been married 41 years since. It's It's been wonderful. But I had thought that once I got married and I had regular sex with my wife, that it would take away the pornography. It would take away uh, the wandering eyes that I had, you know, if, if I was in a parking lot and I saw, you know, a young mother putting her kid into the car seat, she has short shorts, I'd be lusting. Uh, if I saw a, a female jogger, you know, in tight clothes, um, running down the road, uh, I'd be lusting. And so I thought all of that would go away and it, it really didn't. And I, I had a great sex life. Things were going great. Uh, and yet I was still looking at those things, masturbating on a regular basis. And so it was, a, um, it, it had, had, I, I realized that there was something more to it underneath. And mm. uh, the Lord got my attention through two verses. One was Job 31, one, where Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look at a maiden. And uh, I didn't know what a covenant was, but that really struck me uh, that, Job really had that rule in his life. And in Job 31, 7, it's really clear from what he said in that passage that he had actually kept that promise, which I found stunning. The next verse was Luke 6, uh, 6 46, where the Lord says, um, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? Mm. And I'm just like, oh, my word, the Holy Spirit brought that to me just continually over weeks and into months and he just he wasn't a jerk about it he was just wanting me to wrestle with that thought and it finally brought me to the point that with job 31 1 it brought me to the point where i was ready i was beginning to understand what was necessary to win and then i uh, was driving down merle hay road in des moines iowa if you're from des moines you know exactly where i was coming down the hill uh urbandale avenue and looked to my left, saw a girl lusted. And I remember just my heart just shattered inside me. And I slammed my fist into the steering wheel. And I said, no more. I cannot live like this anymore. anymore and I won't. And uh, I don't care if I die trying, but I'm going to figure out how to build a covenant with my eyes and I'm going to win. Uh, I'm not going to live like this. I'm going to become like Christ calls me to be. And uh, it was that day, that moment, actually, that I engaged the battle uh, for true. Uh, I'd sort of engaged the battle before that, but this is this time I meant it. And by truly engaging the battle, it gave the Holy Spirit freedom to begin to guide me into the next steps. And so mm -hmm. um, the, the crazy thing was, even then, I wasn't sure I could win. Uh, to be honest with you, I just wanted to learn enough on the battlefield so I could teach that to my sons and then maybe someday they would grow up and be free. <laughs> but that's how little faith I had in me. Uh, mm -hmm. But against all odds, I won. And uh, crazy as it sounds, it's been over 30 years since I've masturbated. And it's been over 30 years since I even, even had this thought in my head. 
let me go to a computer, let me go to a television and find something lusty to look at. I don't even do that anymore. And uh, had you asked me at the beginning whether that's possible, I would have said absolutely not. No one can live with that kind of freedom where that kind of lust and desire and temptation disappears. Uh, but I'm here to tell you it is possible. Uh, my two sons live like this as well. And I mm -hmm. know many readers that, who have won this victory through Christ. So um, that's my story. And so when you're talking about readers, so let's, I'm going to provide some information to the feel good fathers. Cause I think it's very important for fathers and men to overcome i think the two core worldly elements that afflict us the first being lust the second being anger um, yes. anger we're going to talk about some other time uh, uh probably in part two but today we're really hanging out in this lust world and so the book you're talking about when you're saying the readers this is every man's battle which i know offline we've talked about as your life's work what yes. i'd like to do here is um you shared this is where i want to get into that 23 to 40 age bracket and so on a rough timeline i'm guesstimating mid-20s you meet your wife you're married life is going you're still you're still struggling you said 30 years you had shared to me that this time period was roughly around 40 when you kind of started the what would call a you call sexual sexual purity we'll call it yes. the sexual sobriety right um yeah. well yeah some people call it sobriety i say purity because i'm speaking more from a biblical standpoint. Absolutely. And so to highlight that, right, most fathers become fathers mid to late thirties. So this is right around you're getting, um, I, I'm unsure of your journey, but like statistically most fathers mid to mid to late thirties, low forties, they become fathers. Um, so we're hanging out in this world and it's been 30 years. So for somebody that is looking at this addiction, looking at this, uh, looking at their lifestyle, I think there's two questions. Number one, um, if you're in this, if you're in this, how do you, what are the telltale signs that it's occurring? And secondly, what, um, what impact would you say that adopting sexual purity has had on your relationship and very specifically with your spouse or your wife and with your kids? Yeah. Okay. Big question, but I can do it. Um, you know, I would say that, how do you know it's going on? I think we can go back to a Bible verse called Ephesians 5, 3, where it says that we are not to have even a hint of, sex, of sexual immorality in our lives. And when you Look at the original language. Um, the original language in sexual immorality in that passage is the Greek word pornea, which is obviously where we get the word pornography. Now, Paul wasn't directly talking about pornography per se, uh, pictures of naked women, but he was talking about something a lot more than just simply, you know, having sex with a woman. He was talking about visual. He was talking about thoughts. I mean, there, a lot was wrapped into that word pornea. And so um, one of the things that uh, I realized um, right away, and, and you'll find this interesting if most of the guys listening will too and watching will too, um, I actually uh, have not looked at porn since my wedding day. I mean, literal porn in like a Playboy magazine or, you know, today it would be on a on-site website. And the weird thing is, is the reason why I never did is that I had, this sounds funny because I have integrity in one way and not integrity in another, but financially I knew my wife was also making money. She was a registered nurse. Uh, when she brought the money into the home and I brought the money into the home, it was mixed and I had no right to use her money to buy pornography. Okay. Mm. And so I said to myself, okay, I can't. All right. But the wild thing was, is even without that, I mean, my eyes were like heat seekers, like crazy. Um, so for instance, I'm, I'd get the Sunday morning paper and there would be the department store ad inserts with their lingerie ads every Sunday morning before church, I would 
lust over those and masturbate. I mean, it was just as regular as clockwork. When I was off on, in sales, okay, I, I might be in another town and there would be the exercise shows in the morning and you'd see all the close-ups of the women's rear ends and breasts and thighs and I would lust and I would masturbate then, okay? And so when you say, how do you know that it's there? I think we all know. I mean, uh, the things that we look at and that we um, hang out over, and then we feel the lust rise uh, and, you know, maybe we don't take it all the way to self gratification. Maybe we do, but you know, when you're getting sexual gratification by looking at a woman. And uh, if you're doing that, you have more than a hint of sexual immorality in your life. Mm -hmm. And that's, and for me, it comes back to my life statement to be Christian rather than seem Christian. Uh, it wasn't enough for me to seem Christian in the sense that I'm teaching Sunday school at church and I'm, um, you know, have all my kids sitting with me, you know, in one of the front pews, whatever. I mean, that's just balderdash. I mean, what matters is what are my eyes doing when the soloist comes out with a big slit up her leg? Uh, what are my eyes doing right while she's worshiping the Lord? I mean, these things matter. And mm -hmm. Uh, let me give you an example. I'm going to get to your second question here then. Okay. How did this impact uh, my relationship with my spouse? Well, you know, a lot of guys will say, well, those things are small things. They don't really matter. Oh, yes, they do. Uh, what I had decided to do when I had engaged the battle was the Holy Spirit immediately reminded me of something that I'd learned at Stanford in Human Sexuality 101. I had taken a class as part of my pre-med stuff, and, and that was that. And in that class, they taught us that men are different than women and that we can literally draw sexual gratification through our eyes. That's real, genuine, uh, not just like faux or fake. Uh, it's just as real as me stroking the thigh of a girl or stroking a breast. I mean, it's very real. The impact mm -hmm. in the brain is the same, okay? So we can't say that it's small, especially when you look at what happened in my life when I started to cut that out, because obviously every hint means every hint. So I set up rules to bounce my eyes away from all of these sensual things in my environment. And I, I didn't really understand what might happen. Um, I just knew that I wanted to be able to look God, God in the eye again in prayer. I mean, I'd gotten to the point where I was so embarrassed to go into prayer because I felt so guilty about what my eyes were doing uh, that I, I felt like our relationship was weakened. Uh, and so uh, all I wanted was to be able to pray again. And But what actually happened was very dramatic. Um, as I began to cut these things out of my life, um, I would say within about two weeks, uh, my hunger for Brenda sexually just went through the roof. Most of us know who have been married for a while that we get into an equilibrium and, you know, you know, on Sunday about how many times a week you're going to have sex by the next Sunday. I mean, it's, there's kind of a rhythm that forms. Well, <laughs> I was sort of knocking on the bedroom door more often, so to say, uh, during that time. And, and so much so that Brenda noticed and at first, she was trying to figure out what was going on because she was saying, OK, uh, it, has he been taking aphrodisiac? She was, seriously had that thought. Uh, she was also wondering if perhaps I was having an affair and I was trying to cover my tracks by showing my affection. And one of the things I was doing was, you know, I might walk into the kitchen, slap her in the rear and say, how about tonight, honey, and give her a wink. And I, so I was literally saying things I hadn't been saying for a while either. And so this sort of thing was going on and, and she's, you know, she just kind of thought, well, you know, maybe this is like pregnancy where for a while I really liked, uh, red licorice and hostess ding dongs. And so maybe this is just a, like a jag and it'll go away. Uh, but after about six weeks, uh, one day I came into the kitchen, winked at her and did one of my things. And she turned on her heel, pointed right at me with Clint Eastwood eyes and said, what am I doing to be so attractive so I can stop it? I mean, she was just so frustrated at what was going on and not understanding. Um, I burst out laughing, but then I stopped laughing because I thought, oh gosh, now I got to explain to her what I'm doing. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I really didn't know how to explain it because I didn't really know what was going on. I hadn't read any books. I was just stepping out and following scripture. We sat down on the couch, began to talk about it. And I told her, look, I don't know, but this is what I'm doing. And I'm doing this for you and I'm doing it for the family. Um, I'm, you know, guarding my eyes and all that. She had no idea and because she's a woman. She's not so visual. When I told her, yeah, you know, I'm turning away from billboards that are racy and turning away from joggers. She had no idea what I was talking about in terms of sexual gratification or even why I was doing it. But the one thing I think that was important, uh, go ahead. just just to add something here, I think that something. Um, there's a doctor out of Harvard that released a study on testosterone. It's a fantastic book. And it talks about um, how very specifically that the reason why we, I think we can definitively say these things is that talked about how uh, a transgender person that went from being a woman to a man uh, after being interviewed talked about didn't understand the drive, didn't understand the sexual drive. And there's a lack of, um, and I think in general, I think, it's one of those elements where it's like oil and water that men and women don't understand each other's sexual drives and don't understand. Um, it takes a lot of effort to figure out what the other wants in that world. So, so it's really interesting to, um, and I know specifically this is, this is a, there's a little bit of this in, um, battle on battle over in, in your, your next book about, um, a woman's sexual drive. So I think yes. that that's something for feel good fathers to understand and, and for the feel good parents out there listening, just to understand that we each have and we're bringing something different to the table with regards to our sexual relationships. One thing I want to highlight here is a lot of your discussion in your journey has been on your personal responsibility. And there's been yes. some critics. And I think that there's a, a reasonable discussion here that um, every man's battle places a heck of a lot uh, responsibility on him to have this control and doesn't necessarily discuss any of the social influences or societal influences on, um, his sexual appetite. How would you respond to that? Well, the first thing I want to do, Jay, is I'd like to finish my thought from earlier. Um, because I, I, I want you to understand, I want every guy watching this to understand. We think these things are small. But the moment I cut them out of my life, two things happened. First of all, my entire sexuality was now aimed at Brenda. Mm -hmm. And so much so that, you know, she noticed dramatically. And uh, the second thing is, is that my focus of my drive and my connection with her changed dramatically. So the thing I want to say to everyone is, look, Uh, These are not small things. Uh, When you are getting sexual gratification from outside of your marriage, it is costing you. You are paying a price. Um, So uh, coming back, repeat your question once more, Jay. Sure, no problem. The the book hangs out in a place of a lot of personal responsibility. And even in what you were talking about, you know, shifting your eyes, uh, cutting things out, there's, there's definitely um, uh, an aestheticism, aestheticism there that we're talking about, like just kind of like a denial of it. Um, with, and there's not necessarily a lot of discussion about societal influences. It's been a bit. And so I'm kind of curious how you respond to sort of that review on, on the, the topic. Well, I think that that review or that mindset um, does not follow the science whatsoever. I mean, if you look at what the uh, the, the leading experts on pornography say, uh, what they say is that, hey, um, when you look at porn, when you look at the girl in the string bikini, what happens in your brain is the same thing that happens when you take cocaine or heroin. OK, I mean, you cannot hardly tell the difference in, in when you lay the MRI studies side by side. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, What that means is that Paul was right in 1 Corinthians 6.18 when he said, flee sexual immorality, which means, if you're going to use the word ascetic, which I think is kind of weird, but um, somebody out there did, uh, you know, Paul said, yes, we must flee. Why? He said, because this sin is different because of the way it affects the body and how it locks the body in. And 
I think that he was relating it to the fact that it hooks you uh, in a drug-like way. And so this is what I would say to someone who would say to me, okay, you are cutting things out. You are being aesthetic. Okay. Is that what you would say to a heroin addict? Would you say to them, quit being an aesthetic, go ahead and keep taking your heroin, but we're going to try to figure out a way to get you to stop in the meantime. That's stupid. Okay. The, the thing is, I mean, anybody who would say that they would be called crazy. And we have a tendency in Christianity to deal with sexual sin as if it's an entirely moral issue. Like we can somehow pray our way out of it or think our way out of it. Well, nobody ever says to a heroin addict to pray your way out of it. They all say the first thing you need to do is stop the drugs so that we can get to the things underneath that are driving that drug addiction. This, I would say the same thing. And I found it out in my own life. When I cut the flow of drugs from the pleasure centers of my brain, which would be bouncing my eyes away, uh, starving my mind of lust, being ascetic, if that's the word you want to use, uh, that enabled me then to get behind what was driving that issue, which I talk more about in my second book, Battle on Battle Over. But I, I completely reject the concept that being disciplined is somehow a man's work in a spiritual battle. Well, Paul said I'm supposed to do it. Yeah. He was inspired by God to say it. Uh, we're supposed to flee it. We're supposed to get every hint of sexual immorality out of our lives. And if you look at uh, what Peter said, what John said, what Paul said, we we have responsibilities in remaining blameless before God. We are to rise up and be pure, rise up and be blameless. And it's our choice whether we do that. The Holy Spirit will help us. But until we say, I'm in, you're out. Love it. Well said. Um, I think, you know, the other element for uh, feel good fathers, and I, and I love the way that you phrase that. You're talking about commitment. And um, one thing that's really, well, you're talking about a lot of things. But one, I, one thing I want to highlight is this idea of commitment. Yes. I've always said, you know, um, I never want as a feel good father to be around another man that refers to his wife as the ball and chain in any way, shape oh, or form. Yes. And I flee yeah. them because the, and, yeah. and here's, and I, and I like to break down sequence of events physically in time as and to highlight why I think that's ridiculous. If you're that kind of person, or if you're around those kind of people, number one, uh, the, the most powerful thing you have and the most powerful thing in the world, and we'll talk about the Christian context, then the next context, in the Christian context, God created the world through his word, period, right? So having your word and keeping your word is incredibly important. There's covenants yes. all throughout the Bible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We don't need to get into that too much. But as a, but as a man, as a person in the real world, you stood up, if you got, if you got married in Western society, very likely you were in some sort of church, majority religion. You stood up in front of your family, gave your word to be committed to this person. You stood yes. up in front of her family to be committed to her. And then you swore it by God, very likely. And you swore it by the state. And so there's, there's a certain sense that what you're talking about is this impropriety of involving and bringing other people into your marriage, bringing other people into the person that you've committed to in front of everybody that you know, and the people that you hold most dear that you're going to face. Yes. And so there's, there's a, there's a comical element to what you're talking about, about the absurdity of the activity and about um, acknowledging the fact that you're allowing and putting things between you and the next person. It's very well documented that today we're in a loneliness epidemic. It's very well documented yes. that we're losing the ability to connect with each other. And most of that happens. And I think in this particular context, that's happening because I think it's the, the numbers are staggering. The amount of men that consume porn, it's staggering. It's like three out of four. It's like it's all it's overwhelmingly the majority. You're putting a wedge between you and the person that. If you're a feel good father, you've committed to for the rest of your life. It's, it's mind boggling. And so it, it is. So I think, I think there, I think, I think we've said what we need to say, and please, 
if you're, you know, feel good father listening to this, feel good parent listening to this, this isn't a shame element. This is, this is mainly an idea that we are highlighting, I think, what is an important topic. And we are now going to sort of get into less so the bad side. And we're going to talk more about how do you face, what are the benefits, um, and move, move forward with the conversation. There yeah, the concept. I, Go ahead. Yeah. And, and I guess what I would say to that, Jay, is that uh, you're not just bringing a wedge um, between you and your wife. You're also in some ways um, bringing a wedge into your children's lives between them and God. Uh, let me explain that. When I was first a father, my first uh, child was a son. Uh, I would have been 26 years old when he was born, okay? And he was beautiful. I mean, when he became a toddler, all right, I mean, he'd walk around with a stick in one hand, a little football in the other, and he would drool out of his pacifier and these big bright eyes. And I used to, sometimes when I would be watching him and Brenda would be out, I would I would look at him and I sometimes I would literally burst into tears because I would just I could see that his eyes were saying, Daddy, you're my hero. I want to grow up to be just like you. But I in my heart, I was going, no, don't be like me. I can't save you from the pornography. You have to understand my both my grandfathers were hooked on porn and, and uh, extramarital stuff. I found porn in my dad's desk when he died at 72. Okay. Um, you, you've all heard my story. And I knew uh, that was going to be passed down to my sons. Uh, at that time, I only had one. I have two now, but I was just dying inside. Sometimes literally I would wake up at dawn. My wife always sleeps later than me. So I'm just in bed staring at the ceiling, screaming silently at the Lord. Why did you give me a son? Why did you give me a son? You knew I couldn't protect him. All right. So what I'm trying to say is, is that when we continue in this, this is not a shame element. This is just the truth. All right. I knew that I was going, if I couldn't figure out how to win, I was going to doom him to the same prison cell I was living in. And so one of the reasons I engaged the battle was that, I mean, I couldn't stand the thought of not being able to help my son. And, and then God challenged me one day in prayer. And, and he said, are you the one that's going to change the direction of your family tree? Or are you going to leave it for someone better than you down the line? Oh, my word. When he said that to me, my heart exploded in pain. And the thought of leaving this battle to someone better than me down the road killed me. And the second thing was, God was going to lay that question before Jason one day and say, hey, your dad didn't have what it takes. I gave him all the power. I gave him all the grace, but he didn't commit. Uh, are you going to be the one or am I going to have to leave it for someone better than you? And I mean, this whole thing, uh, it just shattered me. And that's then about the next day or so is when I had that moment on Merle Hay Road and everything changed. Well, so you say to yourself, okay, how does this change your relationships? Well, the first thing that it changed with my wife, I mean, my wife totally never fears that I'm comparing her to someone else. I'm never looking at anyone else. Do you know, uh, my wife regularly looks at what my eyes are doing and I don't even know it. She told me this about 10 years into it. She said she was constantly just checking and she said, mm -hmm. I never once failed to turn away in those 10 years uh, when she was looking. OK, well, what does that do for my wife to know that I'm 100 percent focused on her, 100 percent hers? Um, she has total peace. The second way she has total peace is in our spiritual lives together. She knows that when I go into prayer for my family, there are no strongholds that the enemy can stand on and say, ah, you think you have faith, but I saw what you were doing Saturday night at 11 o'clock when your wife was asleep and you were on the computer. Um, you know, no, uh, she knows that I have real authority because I haven't sacrificed my spiritual authority in my home by looking at porn. Uh, again, no shame. This is just the truth. If you're looking at porn, 
there's a wedge between you and your wife. I can take you to scriptures to prove it. And mm -hmm. so the thing is, my my wife and I live in a much deeper spiritual connection together and also a deeper physical connection. When you talk about my kids, this battle, winning this battle changed everything uh, in my relationship with my four kids. I have two girls, two boys. They've all grown up living in this purity mindset. But I remember just to give you an example, um, I, I would, um, you know, my son, we were lifting weights one time um, and we always pick gyms that are smelly and ugly and made of cement and stuff because we don't want women in there. But that particular day, uh, and, and it's not because women shouldn't lift weights. It's just that we don't want them. We don't want them coming in wearing nothing and standing. I think there's, so, I think there's some, some modern context where to adjust and, and follow some of the modern movements, we've tried to integrate a lot of spaces, but I yes. think, I think that there's a lot of wisdom. Um, I'm not really a big fan of, of the Victorian era. There's a lot of stuff that that, that era people did, did incorrectly. They were oh, the, um, as, as you were talking about the, um, I forget what you said, the, the weekend warriors, they were the weekend, weekend Christians, um, uh, much more uh, concerned with the image. But I think that, you know, um, when you look at what society's doing and sort of the uh, reaction videos and what's kind of happening nowadays is that we're kind of learning what's healthy to be. And we've talked about that uh, working out element earlier. Uh, I think this was off off air. So a friend and I were talking about working out and the the desire to release, you know, um, endorphins and get stronger and that kind of, that kind of jazz. Uh, but we see when there's these mixed spaces, it's, it's creating friction and conflict, you know? Um, and I think that in some, I think that there is a lot of value, you know, education system, the man's, the young boy's brain is roughly a year to two years behind. And for the yes. same level of focus and concentration of a, uh, it takes a man to be between 20 and 25 to have the same level of focus and concentration as a 10 year old girl. And so we're asking our daughters as a father of daughters to hang out with boys that can't sit still and can't learn to the same, the same level. Uh, there's, you know, Richard Reeves has some good, uh, of boys of men has some good discussion about why we want to have, you know, there's an idea about having boys start later so that they have a, a more, mental development. I think that, that in and of itself is going to have a couple of issues um, that are, will already exacerbate um, a, a physicality difference, right? Within a one year's difference, you know, if you're, especially in elementary school, you know, a third grade, uh, what would be today a third grade girl with a fourth grade boy, I mean, dude's going to have like a foot on her. Like it's just going to create, I think it's going to create a, a host of other different issues. Um, but in any case, I want the experts to comment on that. However, what I really want to talk about here is that society has certain acceptable roles. Uh, you know, I think of like some other Christian books like Captivating, Wild at Heart, um, and then some of the modern conceptions of, of men and women, right? We've got like a Tinder world. We have people adopting different kinds of sexual profiles. You have F-boys, um, you know, the, the Pokemon of, of collecting other people, of, of what do they call it, notches in your belt, I think are some of the other terms. You brought up a concept that you hinted at earlier, the hero. What is the hero? How, like, can you bring us up to speed for it? Because this is specifically as you're talking about you, the hero is the road model. And how does it apply to your children? Well, you know, I think that concept means everything. And I was just to finish that story, it, it actually goes right into the concept of hero. You know, my son, we came out of the gym that day. Those three girls came in in wife beater tank top type shirts. And I mean, they were they were falling out all over the place. And my son asked me a question and he said, Dad, um, I don't I don't think girls should lift weights. He actually made that statement and said, it's not that I don't think they should lift weights. But, and I said, it's because of what they were wearing, right? And he said, yeah, don't they know what they're doing to us? And I said, look, what I have found is that it doesn't really matter what they're doing to us uh, or whether they know it or not, okay? What I found that matters is what we do. So I told him that you can't 
you can't lust through your peripheral vision. So next time what we would do is while I was lifting, he could keep them in his peripheral vision. While I, while he's lifting, I'll keep them there. And then we can both just stay pure. On the way home in the car, it, it was silent until he said, Dad, I'm really glad you told me that about peripheral vision because I wouldn't have thought of that on my own. And, and that is part of the heroic mindset of fathers, okay? Um, there are three things that John Eldridge says that we as men that beat strongly in our heart. One is to fight big battles. Number two is to live great adventures. And, and number three is to defend the beauty in our lives, which would be our wife and our kids, you know. And um, that, I love the way he says that because those three elements really do tie down my concept of being heroic, okay? So I am the spiritual leader of my home. What does that mean? I mean, most of us go, what in the world? I mean, my dad was never a spiritual leader. How in the world am I supposed to know what this means? Well, it means exactly that, that I'm to fight big battles spiritually. I'm to live great adventures and to protect those that I love. And one of the things that that entails is when I have spiritual battles in my life, like lust, I need to win. Why? Because number one, I can be heroic and keep my authority over my home to keep the enemy out. Okay. Number two, uh, my kids can look to me and they can see, okay, this guy, he literally lives the truth of God. Uh, the Bible says that we are not to uh, live in such a way as to drive our children to wrath. And when I read that passage, I think in terms of hypocrisy. And if I'm living a hypocrisy style life where I'm saying, son, you can't watch this, but I'm mature enough I can, uh, that's hypocrisy that drives them crazy. And so what happens when we win our battle, say, with anger, or we win our battle, say, with lust, um, then we can teach our children how to win those battles. Uh, and we can have conversations like the one I just talked about with my son that, I mean, once my son can talk to me about this, we can talk about anything. And I can tell you, uh, I think we're going to talk a little later this morning about how I went about teaching my kids to walk in purity. But I can tell you that the process of teaching them opened up a world of communication between us. And uh, so instead of having my sexual sin create a wedge between me and them and between them and God, because they're also losing the battle, now they don't have a wedge between them and God. And there's no wedges between us because we're so open about these issues. Does that help? And does that make sense to you, Jay? It does. So um, to summarize back what I heard, right, as a, as a feel-good father in this sexual purity area, we pursue sexual purity literally because it's strengthening the bonds between us and everybody else that's around us. It eliminates. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we are fighting battles. Okay, look, Jay, we talked about it before we came on air. I mean, men can't live in cubicles their whole life. Uh, I mean, we need a battle to fight. We need an adventure to capture our heart. And God has given us a mantle of conquest that we can go out and we can win battles like this. Uh, we can share this adventure with our wife and kids. And once we're winning big battles, sharing these adventures, defending them, are we heroic? Oh, absolutely. I mean, my wife thinks I'm the biggest hero that's ever walked this earth. Um, and she should in it just within the context of our one family, because I have obeyed. Uh, I have won the victory. I have fought the big battle, lived the great adventure, which proves my manhood. And I've defended her from the enemy, uh, which also proves my manhood. And see, that's a big question these days, I think, Jay. I mean, everybody's asking, well, what does it mean to be a man? And where is manhood? Where are all the men? Well, men have forgotten. They have battles to fight and adventures to live in God. And they spend a lot of their time playing Call of Duty, pretending they're having a battle instead of actually winning a real one. I think what's what's interesting here, because this is my wheelhouse, is, is the video game side, is that what's happening is very related to what you're saying, what happens in the brain when you see a sexual image as a man, is that yes. the I've adventure, 
right? The adventure, the dopamine, the pursuit of status, the competition, yes. the camaraderie, all of it exists in a virtual space. So yes. what's interesting here is that uh, and very briefly talking about the concept of reality starved, we as young boys are not taught and specifically um, society conspires against us. Um, and this is not just for boys, it's for everybody, but society specifically conspires against us from affecting positive change on uh, ourselves and everybody around us. The, um, the, you know, like, let's, let's highlight what, what the, well, I don't want to highlight too much what the examples are, but if you think about it a little bit, how does the world want you to do what it wants you to do versus how, how are you able to live in a way that is meaningful to you, yourself, your family, your kids, your wife, your spouse, et cetera. How are you living in a way that's meaningful to that? And so if you look at the different systems in place, something is going to be driving you towards its desire, not your desire and the desire of your family. So one of the, uh, you know, as we're kind of thinking this through, the other core concept for Feel Good Fathers, and I think this is critical because it's the one piece that we can talk about, is the support of other men and fathers in your life. So yes, how can we as men support each other in this struggle? Because if it affects us, it sure as heck affects everybody else around us. So what can we do to build communities? Uh, what's your perspective on, uh, on building your communities and surrounding yourself with other men? Well, when I first wrote Every Man's Battle, um, I, my book was one of the very first books out on this issue. And um, when I won my battle, I didn't have any friends to go through it with. Okay. So the first thing I want to say is that you can win this battle if you're living on your own. Okay. Without people with you. However, when I rewrote Every Man's Battle for the 20th anniversary, I put in a big section on, on accountability and winning through teamwork. Okay. Because it's just like I said with my son, he said, I wouldn't have thought of that about peripheral vision. All right. Well, I learned that on the battlefield and I can share that with my teammate. All right. And so the guys that are my age, first of all, we can be going through books like every man's battle together and we can learn the principles. We can begin to apply them and then share with each other how it's going, what worked for you, what didn't work, whatever. Uh, and, and we can, first of all, help each other. The second thing is we can encourage each other. Now, the kind of accountability that I don't like is the kind where you get together every other week and you talk about how often you failed and you pat each other in the back and that's that. The kind of accountability I like is the kind where you, you say, okay, I hear what happened. This isn't going to keep happening. We're going to be praying for you. We're all going to start fasting together once a week, whatever. I mean, taking true spiritual weapons and applying them together on the battlefield. And uh, I think what that does is, first of all, it helps to train guys into thinking in terms of heroism. Okay, I, I have to win and I need to fight this big battle, live this adventure with my teammates, and we're all going to be champions on the other side. All right. So that's the mindset. Now, in my book, Battle On, Battle Over, uh, I go on and I talk about local church destiny. Uh, I went into a church one time that was way different than any other church I had ever walked into because all of the men, I mean, the men weren't scared of me like they normally are. They're always afraid I can read something on their forehead like you're having an affair or whatever. Uh, but in this place, everybody was really strong. Everybody was really manly. It was kind of odd. And uh, so I asked the pastor afterwards, and he had said that they had been going through small group, every man's battle classes. I think he had like 30 of them going on at the time at different times that everybody could go through. And that when he had, when they started the every man's battle classes and men started to get free, they literally began to step then up into leadership and began having more active part in the local church. And and until you get the purity problem fixed, and you talked earlier about 75% stuck on porn, 
until you get that fixed, it's hard for guys to listen to a call from the pastor and say, hey, let's take the city. Well, a guy saying, I can't even take my own home. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a loser. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a pervert, whatever he says to himself. And one of the things that happens is if we can work together as men to win this battle, we can then focus on the bigger battles, uh, advancing God's kingdom, uh, bringing people into the kingdom. And, and that's where true heroism long term into eternity happens. Mm -hmm. My man, Fred, thank you so much. This has been, I think, a very illuminating discussion. If folks want to learn more about you, the books you've written, your curriculum, where can they find you and what should they do? I have a website called fredstoker.com, and you can go there and find any of my books. Um, there's other information there as well, but uh, you can also buy all my books anywhere books are sold, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, that sort of thing. So, Fred, everybody. If you like the show, if you like Feel Good Fatherhood, please hit the subscribe button for us. Awesome. And guess what? Right here, right here is the next video. YouTube has decided that this is the one you should watch. Hopefully it's one of mine. I know it'll have a big impact on you. Right here. Click the button. Click the button.